your own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Freedom came under attack on my orders. The United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind in safety. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. Today I'm joined by Congressman Mike Waltz of Florida. Representative Waltz has dedicated his life to this nation, graduating from the Virginia Military Institute and having served over 24 years in the U.S. Army. As an elite Green Beret, Waltz served in the Special Forces all over the world. He was awarded four Bronze Stars and two with Valor. He currently holds the rank of Colonel in the National Guard. In addition to representing his home state of Florida, he has served as a counterterrorism policy advisor to the White House and the Pentagon. Representative Waltz has experienced Afghanistan and the ferocity of the Taliban firsthand. It's an honor to speak with this distinguished American hero. September 7th, we're here with Congressman Mike Waltz from Florida, uh, the first Green Beret to serve in Congress, a guy with a wealth of knowledge of what's happening because Congressman, unlike a lot of people who are on TV talking about this, you were there, you've been in Afghanistan uh, multiple times. I want to get your feelings in general on what's happening because we are just, when we're recording this, a lot of people are seeing this, they can be seeing this 10 years from now. Emotions are hot, people are, are motivated right now and I want I wanted to capture this moment because you, you look back at our lifetime, you know, a nation very much united after 9-11. I feel like that was that moment we all kind of remember where people got behind President Bush and at least for that moment, nine months out of his beginning of his presidency, you know, September 11th happened about eight months, nine months from the Biden presidency. Uh, this happens, you almost have a uniting on a different way because Americans are compassionate people. We see what's happening visually uh, and we're concerned. But how do you feel as someone who's representing uh, an area of Florida that I, I love greatly, uh, how do you feel that, that people are, uh, are, are people uniting under uh, what's going on in Afghanistan? Are we seeing more political division? Well, you know, I can speak for a lot of veterans and, and myself included uh, that you know, we're, we're somewhere on a spectrum between rage and grief. Uh, at, at, at any given moment as, as we've gone through this the last uh, several months. And, you know, not only have I spent time on the ground as a special forces officer, uh, I also had to lead the search for that traitor, Bo Bergdahl, uh, and, and, and know for sure that, that good soldiers died uh, looking for him. And now to see four out of the five of the terrorists that were traded for him now back in charge of what is going to very quickly become a terrorist state, again, puts me somewhere between rage and grief. But I think, you know, taking a step back, um, you know, we have to pause for a moment to really appreciate uh, what a disaster this truly is on multiple levels, uh, in ways that I don't think we're going to fully know uh, for some time to come, but it is certainly uh, a disaster from a humanitarian standpoint, whether they're ethnic minorities or women or so many of our allies, uh, journalists, civil society leaders who stood for freedom and stood with us and stood with America against extremism and against Islamic, uh, these Islamic autocracies. Um, it, it's a disaster from a credibility standpoint you know, who in the heck in the world would sign up for Team USA right now and put their life on the line and their whole family's lives on the line? But you can imagine what our people, what people in Taiwan are thinking or in Ukraine are thinking, 
uh, you know, and, and the, the Chinese, the Russians, and all of our adversaries are being very clear right now, America won't stand with you. Uh, and I just talked to an, a, a, an ambassador from the Middle East uh, who said, look, the message around the world is that jihad is won and democracy is lost. And that is going to put their recruiting on steroids. And then finally, you know, it's a disaster from a counterterrorism standpoint. We are now far less safe. We're in a worse position than we were in 2001. This is gonna be a repeat of when we yanked out of Iraq recklessly under the same team, the Obama-Biden team that led to an ISIS caliphate that launched attacks on the world. But we're gonna have a far worse situation when our military has to go back and deal with it. So across the board, Absolutely. unmitigated disaster. You brought up that you were uh, leading the team in the search for Pope Bird Dog, which I think a lot of people forget about a lot of these big moments that have happened over the last 20 years. But what you're saying is, is very clear but that's a moment we all kind of look back at and you were there, what was that like as someone serving, uh, knowing there were already these kind of massive, you don't wanna say missteps, but misguided moments that were happening uh, on the war on terror. Yeah. We're not talking about just a month ago now or two weeks ago, you're talking about a decade plus ago at this point. What was that like as someone firsthand having to deal with that? I, I can't imagine. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was 2009, the day I took command of the border region, the special operations in the border region, Bergdahl deserted. So, you know, not only have I been on the ground, but I've worked this from the White House. I was Vice President Cheney's counterterrorism advisor, worked it out in the Pentagon. And as a reservist, I was mobilized. I was literally leaving the White House and, and going out and thought, you know, I've got the strategy and now we're going to execute it. And that all got, I mean, the chessboard just got kicked over by one soldier because we devoted everything to find him because we knew he'd be such a propaganda uh, victory for the other side. We also knew at the time that he had stacked up his gear, left his weapon behind, sent emails denouncing uh, uh, America to his father uh, and deserted. And some even would argue defected uh, and was actively working with the Taliban until they turned on him. So we knew all of that, but yet we stopped at everything to go get him. Why? Because we don't leave an American behind, even a deserter. And obviously we didn't get him, but to fast forward and then see him being celebrated as a hero in the Rose Garden, to see Susan Rice pounding the table that he served with honor and distinction was just a slap in the face then. And to now see the Guantanamo, I mean, these were the Taliban's top draft picks that the Obama-Biden administration traded for him to now see them in charge of what is going to be a terrorist mega state uh, with Al Qaeda that is going to come roaring back um, from people that we had in Guantanamo and they gave away. It's a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face to every veteran who suffered uh, and gave blood and treasure to, to put people like that away. Absolutely, and we'll get to the the clear rise that's gonna be coming from uh, the terrorist state, as you said, out of Afghanistan. But yeah. you mentioned, you know, even with deserters, no one was left behind. It was a promise now that feels a little ironic, you know, when a couple weeks ago, we had the same kind of verbiage coming out. No American that wants to get out of Afghanistan is gonna be left behind. How do we justify that when we know that there are plenty of citizens that are still there and are still having these issues getting out. When you bring that up, it just felt like it rang true that you did your mission. You, you got a guy who at that point, uh, not exactly an American hero, if you will, uh, but now there are people who still want to get out. And now this is almost being praised as the end of the war on terror. Uh, yeah. How is that emotion for you? And, and no, what does that look. mean for these broken promises, even to our, to our citizens and to our allies? Well, you know, there, there's two things, that, at least to me, that are just fundamentally un-American here. One, we don't leave people behind. And two, we don't let terrorists dictate the terms for when we go get uh, when we go get our people. Uh, Republican and Democrat members of Congress who were veterans began pounding the table in April. As soon as he made this decision, we said, you cannot pull all of our military assets before you get our people out. Uh, and they did exactly that and shut down our bases. We should have been going out and getting Americans, not sending them emails, which you're hearing from Tony uh, Blinken, uh, Jen Psaki and others. Well, we notified Americans uh, 19 times. Well, when you send an email saying, 
well, good luck. Get through Taliban lines to Kabul, and if you do, then America will get you out. That's unacceptable. And then the other piece, at the same time they were notifying everybody to leave, half of their other officials were saying in the same breath that everything's going to be fine. So it was confusing. The administration did nothing to actively go get Americans and bring them to safety. Fortunately, thank God, so many veterans organizations sprung up uh, in a grassroots-like fashion uh, to take charge where this administration failed to leave. My own congressional office and so many others turned into operations centers with our staff on night watch and literally guiding people through Taliban checkpoints. Uh, it, it's, it's just uh, a mix of incompetence, I think, frankly, heartless apathy um, and, and naivety. But you couple that with this Bergdahl trade and you couple the statements now saying, well, the Taliban have assured us that they're gonna let our people go. <laughs> I mean, it, we, we have essentially, this administration has backed us into potentially the largest hostage crisis since 1979 in Tehran, but it's gonna make that look like a sleepover because every time this Taliban government wants foreign currency, recognition, economic assistance, they can walk down the street and take another uh, another American hostage. And we're seeing right now, they won't let planes go. Uh, and have been sitting there for days because you know they've got the leverage and Biden handed it to them on a silver platter. Is it not crazy to you, and it is to me, as someone who, you know, I was 15 when 9-11 happened, 35 now, uh, living pretty much my whole life with, with the Taliban as, as a term of a, a terrorist organization. And now we're hearing that this is the diplomatic Taliban. We're hearing, you know, we're having a relationship with them. It's rolling off people's, you know, mouths off their tongues like any other government. And it's really shocking as someone who was there and who experienced it was in Afghanistan. I can't imagine that you hear that and can just take that lightly because most of us hear it and it's shocking every time someone says it with authority. Listen, the, the, the Taliban haven't changed. Uh, the only thing that's changed is they have uh, tuned up their propaganda program uh, and and they're dealing uh, yeah and they're dealing with the same administration that, that you know that they got their five top draft picks out of Guantanamo for Bergdahl, right? But let me tell you something. I've seen principals uh, of schools, of girls' schools, uh, run out of town and their families murdered when they tried to make a stand. I've seen a girl's school machine gunned with the girls still in the school. Uh, one of my interpreters uh, was stopped at a Taliban checkpoint and had um, documentation on him. They took him home and beheaded him along with members of his family to send a message. Uh, we had in my last tour, a seven-year-old boy was hung. Uh, because he had dollar bills on him, they hung him and shoved him in his mouth. And I know this is all harsh and graphic, but this is, these are brutal, brutal Islamic extremist thugs. And we've now not only handed them the powers of a state with a central bank and currency and a functioning airport to send terrorists anywhere around the world, but we also, this is the part that just pisses me off the most, is allowed billions of dollars of American equipment, our old equipment, to fall into their hands that future American soldiers uh, are going to have to are going to have to fight with when we have to go back to deal with this problem. It's it's again, it's unconscionable. And it's it's unforgivable. Yeah. You brought up the people of Afghanistan that you dealt with, whether it was your interpreters and now hearing these stories of these children as a dad, as someone who, who yeah. you, you can connect with it. Maybe as someone who was there, is there a misconception? You know, we kind of uh, paint Afghanistan as adversaries, but for the last 20 years, it seems like there's a lot of good people. We see these people running uh, for their lives because they know what's coming. It, we've given them 20 years of freedom. Is that what you experienced? Did you experience that these people were, were the actual people, even people that you, you fought with and served with who were, you know, Afghans? These seemed like good people with, with good hearts. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. The Afghan people are some of the most, some of the most generous, um, uh, heartwarming, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, but people that you'll ever come across. They're also survivalists, though. I mean, they're constantly making life and death decisions. So, you know, when we see them flip sides because the narrative out there is America abandoned you and the Taliban's yeah. going to win eventually, and the Taliban's sending a message whether you're an Afghan army commander or a politician and saying, join us or you and your family will be beheaded. And America has made it very clear 
they've left you high and dry, then you know people make those life and death decisions. And it's understandable. And on the Afghan army piece, where Biden keeps saying they won't fight, yeah, they keep getting blamed. Yes, we gave them a lot. Of, they gave them a lot of equipment over the years. Absolutely. And there's a lot of accountability that needs to happen there. But at the same time, he set them up for failure. He pulled away their air support, their intelligence support, their logistics support, and all their maintenance support for their own equipment all at once. And what do you expect? Uh, pulled the rug out from under at the height of the fighting season, and it, right? And, and, it, it, you know, and refused to send any air power back in or change, you know, when it, it clearly our assumptions were wrong to kind of change course. And, you know, here, now we are where we are. We're getting to that point now where we do have to start looking towards the future. You've, you've kind of famously uh, said, you know, what happened in Afghanistan doesn't stay there. You, moments like the White House won't lead, Congress will. I know that you are uh, on the House Armed Service Committee. People are gonna be turning to turning away from the White House and turning, what can our local representatives do? So I guess for you, for Congress, what can you do uh, to help in this situation? Because people feel hopeless. Well, you know, one, we're gonna hold the administration to the law. Um, and right now, the Taliban's a specially designated terrorist. Uh, and and members of their cabinet they just appointed are, are actual designated foreign terrorist operatives. So th th there's actual legal ramifications in dealing with them or giving them any kind of aid uh, or what have you. We're gonna get to the bottom of how these decisions were made, whether it was closing Bagram, uh, the, the the loss of billions of dollars of, of equipment that future American soldiers are going to fight uh, have to fight through. So there's an accountability aspect. Uh, frankly, I'm I'm a little skeptical under Nancy Pelosi. It's one of the many reasons we have to get the majority back to really get to the bottom of these lies that we've seen coming out and spin that we've seen coming out of the White House. But then most importantly, I think going forward is holding people's feet to the fire. We are gonna see a rise in threats to the homeland. Uh, is getting that, making sure that intelligence isn't suppressed. What is this term over the horizon counterterrorism? I can tell you, you haven't, haven't done this a thousand times. You gotta be on the ground. Doesn't have to be this maximalist decision, this false choice that Biden keeps presenting of no one or D-Day style invasions with hundreds of thousands of American troops we can have small forces of intelligence and special operatives, right? And it's holding their feet to the fire of how we're gonna keep the homeland safe given this disaster uh, that, um, that they've allowed to unfold. And essentially a terrorist state now for, uh, for ISIS and Al Qaeda and the Taliban to play with as they all unite in jihad against the West. And you know, we had those, you know, the first timeline, the 90 days, maybe they would come back and you'd have Taliban rule. Then all of a sudden now you're, you flip to the Pentagon, talking openly now, kind of to your point of the resurgence of terror and what that means. There's also a lot of finger pointing going on uh, within this administration saying, well, this was a Trump plan. This was the Trump administration. And, and look, I think that there's a lot of people who didn't know how things were gonna go. But was this inevitable as someone who was there who experienced this and some currently you know, obviously in Congress is this was this inevitable that that it was going to end in chaos that we would have a war on terror and the war in Afghanistan no. end like this? Well, no, it didn't have to end this way. This was this was incompetent. And I, and I just have said on the record publicly and to President uh, Trump's teams that I had real concern that, uh, that that I don't think the Taliban were ever serious about peace, that they were always trying to buy time so that they could position for power. That said, within the agreement, there were three key conditions. They had to enter into serious negotiations with the Afghan government, never did it. They had to uh, they had to enter into a ceasefire, never did it. And they had to publicly break with Al Qaeda. They never did that either. And at the end of the day, President Trump left a small force there to bolster the Afghan army and to keep a lid on these terrorist groups. The other piece that's just such garbage from the uh, from the administration, the Biden administration's had no problem tearing up Trump deals, from Keystone Pipeline to Nord Stream, uh, to Paris, to Israel, to Iran. But suddenly, they're absolutely bound uh, by this one, even though none of those conditions were met. It's it's feckless and weak, 
excuse making. And, you know, and on the one hand, he says the buck stops here and then he proceeds to blame everybody but himself and his team. Yeah, it's the it's so, what's being repeated over and over and over again from the administration. And you see now, not only you mentioned our adversaries, you mentioned, you know, China and, and Russia and, and all of these uh, countries that and how this could play out for them, but also how it could play out for our allies. We've seen the UK, we've seen other uh, people who said, I don't know if we can fully trust the United States to do this anymore. Yeah. How, where do we go from here for that? I mean, you, you can't, you, we have to win the trust back of our allies when, when we handle situations like this. Well, but let me just address that piece with, with, with China. They're the big winner here. Biden keeps saying, well, the thing they, they wanted to see us bog down again, because he presents this false maximalist choice that we were going to have hundreds of thousands of troops there. Not true. Uh, but here's why China is the big winner. Number one, we closed down our air base right on their Western border. It was a few hundred miles from their new ICBM fields. Uh, we had a 12,000 foot, you know, fantastic base in Bagram base uh, that was sandwiched between China, Russia, and Iran. Kind of a key strategic asset that Biden just gave away. Number two, China now has access to trillions of dollars of rare earth and critical minerals. World's second largest lithium reserve, world's third largest copper reserves that we were working with the Afghan government to get access to. China now has free reign. And then third, they've got, uh, to, to your point, uh, they now can further isolate India, uh, what I think is the most consequential relationship in the 21st century, because they've got this China-Pakistan-Taliban nexus, and they've got the propaganda victory, which they're deploying against Taiwan as we speak. So China is a winner on multiple levels here. Again, for free, we just handed it to them. Uh, and Russia is doing the same with Ukraine. Uh, they're doing the same with the Baltic and, and Balkan states. Uh, this is going to be a blow to American credibility that we haven't seen since the 1970s. But it's going to I think it's going to last far longer. How do we go? Where do we go from here? How do we get? Well, we get him out uh, by 2024. I wish he'd resign uh, and we get the majority back in 2022. Uh, you know, we, we have to win this at the ballot box in order because these you know, th this band of appeasement terrorist apologists who have a long history of doing this, uh, I don't think are going to change course until the homelands hit again, unfortunately. Yeah, and you've brought that up that you think that that, you know, sadly, with these kind of plans feels almost inevitable. And you know, I, I hate that even concept. I hate that for our kids, uh, that they have to now potentially live through this. And I, I wanted to kind of land here with you with a couple different questions of, about the war. But knowing now how this all unfolded, knowing the last few weeks and how essentially the war in Afghanistan ended. Now, I know you have some thoughts that this is not the end, uh, but do you believe that we may, I mean, you were there. Do you believe now looking back on this 20 years retrospectively that we are making the right decision to be there, that we were doing the right thing for the American people and for even for the people of Afghanistan? I'm just curious on a broad look at this, knowing yeah. that what we know now. Well, I, I think absolutely it was the right thing to go uh, to go in and obviously bring Osama bin Laden to justice eventually, which, by the way, Biden opposed and Blinken opposed at the time. We had to take down Al Qaeda. We had to take down the Taliban. I wrote an entire book called Warrior Diplomat on the mistakes that we made in the Bush administration and the Obama uh, administration afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of things we could have done differently and should have done better and should learn from. Um, but that said, as long as Al Qaeda is at war with us, look, I get the hard, long, expensive 20 years uh, and, and, and all kinds of things we've done wrong. But at the end of the day, as long as Al Qaeda fully intends to hit us again in the homeland, I want to fight it forward. I don't want to wait until we have another San Bernardino or Pulse nightclub or God forbid, another 9-11. And I think we should learn from the lesson in Iraq where we yanked everybody out uh, and that led to the rise of the ISIS caliphate. Unfortunately, I think we are going to have to have, we are gonna have to go back. We are gonna have to have a, a small presence there. And that's like an insurance premium that we're gonna have to pay uh, uh, in order to prevent the catastrophic attacks because ultimately we're dealing with an ideology. We're dealing with an idea uh, it took decades to defeat communism and fascism. It's going to take a long time to defeat the idea of Islamic extremism. And I don't want to wait until this cancer spreads until it is so monstrous 
that it takes far more blood and treasure uh, to deal with it. And I certainly don't want to wait until it hits us at home again. And for future elections and future uh, things that will happen like that, that are consequential, I think what's important is to remind people of what's going on right now. And that's why we're doing this now to tell people, to remind people even in a few years, five years, 10 years, 20 years even, the emotions that you're going through, that a lot of us are going through right now because it's been relatively quiet for years yeah. and we forgot. And though I was shouting it from the rooftops and telling people that, look, just wait, if, if this is how things go, we're gonna be talking about Islamic terrorism in a year or less. And here we are and it's happening right. again, but it's easily one of those topics because uh, when things are good, we're not talking about it, that people forgot. And, and we have to make sure that people are, are continually reminded that, that this isn't gone anywhere. And though there were successes in terms of taking on ISIS for the time being, that quickly things can go back into chaos and it can affect us here. No, that, that, you know, that's absolutely right. They fully intend to. Biden's own intelligence community says they intend to. Uh, it, you know, but then you see Biden go to the podium and say, well, Al-Qaeda you know, really wasn't much of a threat. They're on their back foot. You know, they, we've decimated. That's because we were there. That's because we were kicking the snot out of them and pressuring them night after night after night, again, with a small presence. Uh, but now you know, we have no bases, no local allies, uh, and we have a terrorist army armed to the teeth. So at least when we had to clean up the Obama mess in Iraq, we had Israel, we had Turkey, we had the Kurds to work with on the ground. We had bases from the Gulf. You look around Afghanistan, not a single country has agreed to base any of our special forces or intelligence assets. And they're not going to because China and Russia aren't going to let them. So that's what's, uh, you know, that's what's so devastating here is I know that we're gonna have to go back to deal with it and we have so far fewer tools so uh, than, than we did when we cleaned up the ISIS mess and President Trump unleashed <laughs> the military to do what it does best. We don't have that now. Uh, around Afghanistan and it's it's going to be incredibly costly and that blood is going to be on Biden's hands and I'm going to make sure absolutely to hold them accountable. And that's where I want to wrap up with you is where I've wrapped up with everybody which is we need to not lose sight also of the 20 years of sacrifice that people like yourself and many members of the military and the armed service, even people, private contractors that were there who served in Afghanistan. This fight wasn't in vain, that there were good cause and people I know, I'm sure, like yourself, they see the ending, especially families who lost loved ones, I'm sure are going, well, this was this whole thing in vain, knowing just the ending. It's easy to focus on just this last few weeks, but I wanted to give you time to talk about that before we wrap up, just about making sure that we continue to respect those that served. Yeah, I, I, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is painful in my soul right now. I mean, it really is. Uh, somewhere between just rage and grief at any given moment on a spectrum. Uh, but I want also those veterans and those Gold Star families and those victims of 9-11 to hear me loud and clear. Uh, their sacrifice was not in vain. Your loved one's sacrifice was not in vain. You kept America safe for decades. An entire generation has grown up now, not worried about planes flying into buildings, not worried about suicide bombers on buses or in shopping malls uh, because we were fighting this, this scourge forward. Uh, you have every right to be angry and upset. Uh, I know I am, uh, but it was not in vain. But if you are going to a dark place, uh, please reach out uh, and talk to someone. And, and I've got to tell you, these veterans groups that have been on the phone with our allies, with uh, Americans scared, being hunted by the Taliban, getting uh, beaten or worse at checkpoints. This has been brutal on them as they've had to guide them through, as they've had to step in and do the job that our government has done. We've actually sent in mental health services for some of them uh, to, to, to kind of get their mind right and, and, and be able to help them uh, through this. So I'm not gonna sugarcoat how tough this is, but thank you for allowing me to say 100% not in vain, 100%. Well, Congressman Waltz, I wanna obviously thank you obviously for your service as well to this country uh, now and previously, and thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you. thanks so much.